Uh, welcome to the Driveline Baseball Podcast. I'm joined here with uh, Kyle Wasserberger, our principal sports scientist, uh, and Chris Langan, our director of pitching. And today we're going to be talking about motion, all things motion capture, uh, specifically related to pitching and pitching mechanics. Uh, but we're going to go into, you know, why it's important, why it's different than video analysis, some of the limitations of even the most gold standard of, of motion capture reports, and how some of the best coaches in the world are using what is now like a, a brand new data source uh, to mine. I think, I think maybe to, to get started, uh, you know, motion capture is uh, an old technology, but it's also now being deployed uh, in a lot of new places inside of baseball, what are some of the what are some of the places that are that are brand new for motion capture technology and sort of how it's become very ubiquitous? Um, yeah, so I mean, tradition, like Mike said, technology has been a lot around for a while, but it's traditionally been you know limited to labs, you know, confined spaces, um, you know, one off assessments. But with markerless motion capture becoming more and more uh, prominent. We're getting in-game data. We're getting, you know, more frequent bullpen data. We're getting player tracking outside of pitching and hitting. Um, yeah, it's kind of everywhere now. What are, what are some of the ways that? Uh, l let's talk about what what is just generally what it, what do you mean when you say markered motion capture? What is what is markerless motion capture, and how is markerless different than like? just video analysis. So Mark Erd motion capture is if you've seen driveline social media with athletes in their underwear and got a bunch of reflective dots placed all over them, that's Mark Erd motion capture. We're putting markers on the body that the cameras see and track. And then we recreate the athlete skeleton from those markers. On the other hand, markerless eliminates the need for those markers on the body and instead directly uh, recreates the human skeleton from the video itself. So it's a lot less invasive. Uh, athletes can throw or swing um, in their normal you know, attire. Uh, the cameras can be not just in a lab, but they can be surrounding uh, you know, the actual uh, plane surface so we can get in-game data. And then how it's better than actual video, just straight up video analysis is that we're getting hardcore numbers uh, unique to each athlete and how they move um, as opposed to just relying on the eye test, which, you know, can be good and can be sufficient, but is often can often fall short, is, uh, you know, susceptible to biases and all that stuff that, you know, we've covered ad nauseum in, in other uh, podcast episodes. There, there was a, you know, there, there was previously a, a trend uh, or like, you know, prior to the advent of a lot of markerless systems, uh, you know, guys would film video and then put dots in the video, like draw lines and, and like do joint anchors, like in the, in the video in like MS Paint or Adobe, whatever. Is that essentially what markerless is doing? Like uh, systems? No, um, it's like a souped up version of that, where if you're just got if you just have one camera and you're drawing angles on the screen using MS Paint or even some more, you know, sophisticated, you know, coaching software, uh, you can easily fall vict victim to something that's known as parallax error, uh, which is basically just a fancy term for unless the the athlete is moving, you know, right in line with the view of the camera, there's some distortion uh, to the actual joint angles that you would then draw on the screen. And right. So if I flex my elbow directly facing the camera, you know, drawing lines on the screen is, you know, good enough. But it, unless but if I start flexing my elbow out of the plane of the camera, then you get a lot of distortion there. And what Markerless does is it uses multiple cameras. Right, it gets distorted because like you can't see it, like the camera can't see it. Right, yeah, like if I just flex my elbow directly to and from the camera, like how are you supposed to draw lines to figure out what my elbow flexion angle is, right? Got it. Here, you can, you can do it because it's, you know, in view of the camera, but what about if it's here, you know? You can't Got directly it. tell, and so 
what markerless does is it uses multiple cameras. You know, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's 10, uh, but it takes care of that parallax error problem and recreates the skeleton in three dimensions, no matter where the athlete is moving. Got it. So let's, let's talk through sort of like the history of markerless usage at, at driveline specifically. Uh, and you know, we originally began, uh, and, and I think it's, interesting or, or uh, important to to think to to explain a bit like how processing that data influences its accuracy as well right because like we originally started with uh, a markered lab with a v1 biomechanics pipeline we then went through six iterations of that pipeline for markered data and now we have a lab that can process either marker list data for volumetric capture or marker data if we're trying to get like very specific uh, information. Could you could you talk a little bit about how the pipelines impact the accuracy? And then, uh, Chris, I want to talk to you a little bit about how we've evolved using that that data. Yeah, so we first rolled out markerless motion capture, I don't know, a little over a year ago, and it wasn't in production then, but we were collecting the data. Um, and then just recently, kind of within the last, I don't know, three to six months, we've started uh, using markerless data in production. Uh, but what when Mike said we went through six iterations of a markered pipeline, um, that was to ensure, you know, maximum accuracy, maximum repeatability. Uh, not only between athletes, but also as an athlete assesses and retests. And doing that for, I don't know how many years, Mike, six years, um, allowed us to have this massive reference of bio markered biomechanics data that we can then implement a new technology like marker lists, and we can see how they relate to each other, and we can relate the new tech to our foundational uh, database with the old tech. Um, and so they really uh, complement each other. And we didn't switch over to Markerless until we were very, very confident and we had a large paired data set um, comp directly comparing, you know, within the same pictures, mark the Markerless data and the marker data. And Chris, how, is, how has that change been uh, received or, or implemented like inside of the training sessions? Like what's, what's different from the coaching perspective or, or from the athlete perspective? Just from like a markerless first uh, marker, or just from like the evolution of the boat gap and how we've like utilized the data, I guess, like, or e just either, the whole... e either way, either no. way. So I think the biggest thing, I mean, one like Wasserberger said, the amount of data we have is just extraordinary. I think it's like one of the we're we're gonna see more uh, mocap labs and stuff uh, pop up around the country and whatnot. But the amount of data we have and the amount of things we've already like you know, looked into and struggled with, had hypotheses on, and then like got a conclusion after going through this process. I think it can't be um, overstated how important that is to kind of actually have the sample, all the coaches see it, you coach athletes, you make some worse, you make some better. And as you have that data, sometimes it goes from being super exciting to like, okay, we kind of know what matters. Um, but I think that's probably the biggest thing with the mocap lab uh, since I've been here in 2019 to 2024, it's really getting to the crux of um, what matters. Uh, and also just like um, in terms of the marker versus marker lists, uh, I know guys like not having to put the sticky stuff on as much anymore. Uh, I can get through it a little bit quicker um, for pro athletes, uh, high level guys or anybody who's like looking into commands specifically, much easier to generate those samples now and acquire that data. Um, so there's a lot of things with volume um, and getting a bit more specific, uh, we basically have what we call population data set, which is everybody's mocap data. And you can like pair those correlations and see in general, somebody walks in, we know nothing about them. It's gonna kind of tell you if you had to guess, here's like the metric that's most important. Uh, when you get it on a more individual basis, you actually then can start to, uh, and you know, you can bucket the athlete by some form of group by based off how they move to some degree. But there is something to be said about being that one individual athlete and having four to six retests and being able to apply, um, you know, update your priors and really apply the information now in a way where 
as a coach, contextually, you have your initial assessment with the athlete and you're looking at everything. Well, that conversation is gonna change in assessment four to six uh, because you now have these retests with this athlete and you can really actually uh, increase your probability and certainty in knowing exactly what for that athlete they should be doing. We look at the overall mocap and we get a good idea, especially relative to the market, for years just by having the sample overall population. What I think is exciting with the markerless stuff is the amount of volume and retests you can generate because that way, now the competitive advantage is saying I've got four to six retests of myself and I can see how with this sample of data, how scap retraction or hip shoulder separation impacts me. That doesn't make the sample population hypotheses we provide invaluable at the time. It simply says if you want the best amount of information, you want more context, you want to apply it to you specifically and maximize your career, that four to six retests, that's then when you can start to see on an individual athlete basis a bit more how they respond um, to certain movements or if there's certain things, we've seen a lot of um, things where somebody does five out of six things well and like the sixth one, whatever, maybe it's lead leg block um, or hip shoulder separation, they just omit it. And you just learn to omit it, you know, because it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be in there. Um, and one of the ways of really nailing down that that was the right decision or if you need to update that is getting the retest and see how that weak metric um, kind of corresponds as you have these velocity increases and decreases in the retest um, to kind of know the actual significance of that. So that's kind of how I've seen the mocap evolve. Um, and I think the, the next step here with the markerless stuff is obviously uh, – a little bit of like probably initial command stuff where we're not going to be able to we just need to gather a lot of the data before concluding a ton there um and then for the retest and mechanical portion i think it's getting into more of the sample population was the previous thing now we're at we got more mocap volume got more competition with it it becomes an individual basis and uh that's really when you, you really want to jump start your career you start with the initial assessment and if you want to really maximize it and get the truth out of everything getting those retests in, in addition is, you know, really the, the main way. So uh, what, what I'm hearing is like the, is it fair to say that like part of the, part of the value in a, in a pitching mocap, at least initially, if you're an initial athlete is because we have this huge database of, of athletes that we've built up with like paired data sets with the most accurate, possible collection material plus all these other things that like we can hone in on what the right course of action is extremely quickly or at least have like a pretty good chance of getting it right on the first shot and then the next thing is like the longer that you train and get exposure to like retest after retest the more likely that you are to be able to generate with your coach a real understanding of like okay this is this is like my mechanical signature and this is sort of the things that i can adjust easily and this is the stuff that like is really really hard for me and we should just like we don't have enough time to tackle that in a substantive way right i think the way i look at it is um five six years ago that sample population the competition and the amount of information that they're was uh, for athletes and think of these athletes as competing with other athletes, that information, that sample population was such an insane advantage to have as an athlete that it, you know, we had guys retest and stuff, but you didn't really have to get as nuanced with getting the individual um, proportion to have when you come to driveline, you get a mocap, have it be a massive competitive advantage. As things are becoming more accepted and you get more mocaps, I would do the sample population or the initial assessment. That is now the 80-20 rule of your biomechanics. If you come in, right, and you, if you're a division two pitcher, let's say, and you think you have a shot at being a big leaguer, if you get the mechanical analysis uh, with the sample population and you're 88, it should at least be able to get you to know if like you're gonna have a shot at throwing 95. That's kind of, I think, the main component of it, right? Like if you don't see any gains though at 88, with the initial mocap, it is giving a lot of initial information. What I think the big thing is though, is like for these guys, when we look at major leaguers, we look at minor leaguers, 
it is so small the amount of difference that like and especially when you hit that quad a to you know true mob player the amount of difference a small percentage um of being a little bit better makes on your career earnings and how much you make so having those individual retests at that point uh we're at a point now in in player development where the market is you know I'm not, i know not everybody does it but it's become a bit more accepted to mocap and have some understanding of these terms in a quantitative format to where if you do this retest assessment now i i truly believe that is the mechanism for like athletes i feel like it's the mechanism for me as a coach to kind of uh with that information hey now we've got a more uh clear picture we've got a little bit of a competitive advantage here because everybody else is either going off sample population data um or you know they're going off of it it doesn't work but they're not getting the retests and they kind of just uh they alter their coaching to you know something that like sounds good or uh you know whatever the coach believes that kind of makes sense so that's how i i view this that and that's kind of how i view the the individual um retest and, and obviously the last thing i'd say on it is the ability to do it markerless is important very literally because of the fact that uh the markers it, I, I just think it would take too long to, to actually get through it and, and get guys um especially for command uh to, to get guys you know genuine retests with the uh ease uh we've been able to so that's kind yeah. of the, kind of my thoughts there what's uh and and maybe i've, I've got a couple of questions here but you know the we we obviously have this like huge uh data set from the players that we've been running through biomechanical assessments for for quite a long period of time how does that make the initial report different than something that you would get as like a printout from the qualysis system or like something that a team would generate off of off of hawkeye data like where where is our thing different unique like how how are we using that information for the player's benefit i think i mean i think the main thing is you just actually have a reference point for what the numbers mean and like a true uh you know it's kind of like a, a 2080 scale it does so to speak you're actually like applying it i'll give a weird example but i think it does apply five four years ago when i was coaching juco and we did plyo velos people would throw the blue ball and they kind of look at that is that a good number you know it's like hey it's 63 right so when you're looking at the uh, mechanical information from somebody and it pops out numbers. They're not wrong. Like, hey, here's, here's your torso angle, here's this. But what the athlete wants to know to like understand is like, is that 63 blue ball any good? So you have to give them a reference for like about what the range is for, uh, you know, your velocity and what that blue ball should be. But if you've ever done a plyo velo with a group and not explained it, you're gonna get a whole lot of confusion on if they should cheer or kind of boo. And I think, uh, what it does with the reference points and the amount of uh, athlete samples is it actually uh, allows you to say, hey, I don't really care about like what my trunk angle is. I just want to know if it's like even important. Uh, and then from there, I think that's when you can start to apply, uh, hey, here's the logic we have behind how you can improve it. But it doesn't really do much if you just say, hey, here's your torso angle, here's your pelvis angle, here's your how fast your uh, you know shoulder rotates? It, it's uh, it's true. You're giving the data. You you are applying some data data driven insights. You're you're giving them information. But if you don't have the referencing capability, your the whole practical purpose of it just it, it is useless. And you know you want this stuff to convert to value. You don't want it to convert to public perception of sounding like you're doing something um, when it you know so it sounds good to the rest of the world or whatever. But if your athletes aren't ben benefiting from it, then uh, it's kind of chicken shit. So that's kind of the, the main thing I have there. Hey, Kyle, what do you yeah. what do you think? Yeah, to to Chris's point, the reference like it matters what you what you're being referenced to, right? And with our reports, you get referenced to either our elite group or like a, a developmentally similar group. And our elite group is, uh, I think, the current cutoff is 93 miles an hour and above uh, for fastball velo. So. Um, depending on, you know, reports from other places, you don't know, like maybe their elite group is 85 miles an hour and above or something like that. And, you know, maybe that's not a good enough reference for you. Um, but what I will say is that those other reports are kind of like our first report where it's just, here's your joint angles, here's your different areas. Um, and it's, you know, multiple pages and whatnot. And we've kind of we've kind of supplemented that or kind of prefer that to what we now use as our composite score report, uh, where it kind of, it, it reduces mechanics into the five or six key areas that we think matter based on our extensive 
you know, history training athletes, and you get a you get both a one number score of that mechanical area, but then you can also dive into uh, the metrics that go into each score uh, and see their relative importance or their importance relative to each other. You can see which ones are included, which ones didn't make the cut uh, for mattering. And so that kind of helps cover both a mile wide and an inch deep, but also a mile or an inch wide and a mile deep uh, and all within one report. I see. And, and a composite score just means like there's like, uh, you know, you get sort of like you get your elbow metrics, you get your shoulder metrics, you get your torso rotation metrics, but that all gets combined into like a weighted arm action score or like you've got yeah. your knee stuff and your hip stuff. And that's like a lower half score. And then there's some other, some other scores as well, but you, you're talking about like, rather than just looking at these numbers in isolation and to Chris's point being like, Oh, my elbow flexion is 70. Like, is that good? Like, should we cheer or boo? Uh, <laughs> yeah. That we're that, it, that it's like, Hey, like it's elbow flexion at 70 plus these other three metrics are giving you a low score like that. We yeah. Need to, that we need to work on. Yeah. And I, I think it's all about, you know, providing a minimally effective dose and we want to provide the athlete with as much data as we need to get them better, but no more. Right. And so if we can start with a one number uh, summary that uh, is the output from a statistical model that combines elbow flexion, layback, scap retraction, a couple other things, you can provide a one number result of that. And then if that's really good or really bad, you're like, oh, I wonder why it's really good or really bad. And then dive in and see which of those metrics is driving your underperformance or overperformance. Um, that kind of allows the athlete and their trainer to start at, you know, one number, not too much information. Does this pass? Are you doing this well enough? Okay, then we can, we don't need to spend training economy on it. Or, hey, this number is low. Let's look into why it's low. And then, then go to that, like, whole you know, multiple metrics level. That makes, that makes sense. Chris, how do you feel like that's changed? Like the way that you approach coaching guys or the way that you even like guide new, uh, coaches at driveline through like interpreting a lot of this data and like what, what stuff to lean in on. I think, I think it's very important to have, uh, never leverage like, uh, the idea of a coach, right? If a player's talking to a coach, he's the coach. So like, there's sometimes a built-in laziness to being able to provide the information in a way that like, is very palpable for the athlete. When I was first at Driveline, I felt um, sometimes to get to some of this type of information, it required a, you know, a certain skill set of coding or, you know, we were just earlier in the process so we didn't have it as accessible. Um, and one thing I found is I could kind of go in and see, hey, I don't, you know, I, I, I mechanics matter. I'm not indicating that. I'm just saying I can. It, it's pretty clear to me that if an average person that talks about mechanics works in facility looks at these numbers, they're going to be blown away at like the actual impact of this. And I think the biggest thing for me is I could view that in my head and I could tell people that's how I felt and like I could give them uh, some like you know quick rundown of the numbers. But when you have the composite scores it makes it where you don't even necessarily have to explain all of that anecdotal stuff. You just say, hey, here's a big sample set of data. Here is what is happening. And it's just a nice report that actually summarizes all of that stuff for you. And you, it does it in a way where you don't feel like you're having to convince somebody of it. It's like, hey, this is this is the report. This is what it looks like. I Instead of just like, I can go through telling you what this means, my perspective of it, but I want you to ask until you like have this feel palpable to you. Um, and I think having those reports there and, and kind of um, constantly, one of the biggest things is just constantly getting retests and constantly coaching it. It just humbles you a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, more or less what I've learned is that when you have newer coaches come in, you just need something that can get, if it took me eight months to understand something as a coach, for the next guy that comes in, I want it to take six. And for the next guy that comes in, I want it to take four. And I think that's where uh, these types of reports um, and summaries have helped a lot is getting it uh, to that point quicker for the athlete and the coach to really um, identify with the concept in a way that is not just like, oh, driveline told me this, in a way that is like, no, I, I truly grasp and believe it. Um, 
yeah. for like what it is, you know. So, yeah, I remember uh, we had a we had a pitcher come in, and this was like very very early days of uh, of a lot of the mocap stuff being rolled out. But uh, you know, he he tested, and then uh, you know, and he was a big leaguer at the time, uh, still is, and and so he he went through his his analysis. And he had this like kind of funky mechanical thing, uh, and and immediately, what the report was showing him was like, yeah, this looks funny, but you are actually like landing on time and basically in sync, to the point where like the whole motion is like working to transfer energy from the ground into the ball. Like you're actually doing a pretty good job, even though this thing like looks kind of funny if you just like kind of eyeball it. And the thing that he, the thing that resonated with him was like, oh yeah, that like, that gives me the confidence. Like now that I know that this is a true thing, that gives me the confidence to like go execute. And when the next time that somebody in my life brings up like, hey, do you know that like you have this funky little thing that's going on? He's like, yeah, but that's just me. Like that's just who I am. You know, like that's, that's me. I, I do that, and, and but like I can go out and and compete, and, and like I, I always, you know, thought of that for for two reasons. One, like it's a good it's a good indicator of like the types of non consensus insights that like rigorous data capture can provide. But then the second thing is like the value that it provides to the coach. To be like, like if you were, if you were a coach and you had that athlete and you had previously been trying to like train this thing out of him because you thought it was bad, but then the data like updates you to be like, Hey, you know, stop. Like that should seriously update a lot of your priors around what you're even doing as a, as a coach, a lot of, a lot of, you know, canonically, that's a pretty rare thing uh, from a coaching standpoint. Uh, but Chris, do you, do you have like examples that come to mind of, of athletes where you were like, oh man, I was trying this one thing and then, you know, it just couldn't update because like he couldn't get it done because of the mocap. So we like found another way around or like examples where, cause you mentioned like the mocap data can be humbling as a, as a coach. And I'm curious, like when one of those times was, um, I mean, I think it's just, it's like there's just never like a specific moment, you know? Uh, I think, I think there's, uh, I guess some of it is just like speaking that too to the athlete, that, that's important. As you learn more, you start to like, hey, like before maybe you look at it as like, hey, you need to move faster at peak leg lift. Like it's the only way you can throw harder versus when you've really made a relationship with the athlete and they've like gotten to know your like reference point for uh, truth, how, how much you, how much your words like the volume of them how much that implies your certainty level if you have that relationship with the athlete and talk to them for a lot of time you can get to the point where you'd be like uh hey like at peak leg lift this looks like about the only way you would be able to throw two miles an hour harder because you've done everything else uh but it might ruin the rest of your delivery um that's one way i explained it to like alex Cobb. Uh, he basically has seen all of his stuff like across the board. It's been a very like, it's very uh, hard to say. It's not one of those mechanical improvements where like you have this big uh, jump in one of the biomech buckets and then everything else stays the same. It's just been like across the board mechanical improvement. But like his COG at peak leg lift just like doesn't move. Like he has a weird little uh, like funk in his delivery or whatever, uh, where like at the top of leg lift, he's just like, he's not really moving yet. Um, but heck, he's, he's approved everything else to where I just like, I was like, Hey, like, uh, I mean, if you want to throw, you know, hundred miles an hour, like in theory, like you probably would sell out for this. If I had like, with the information I have, that's what you would do, you know, but mm -hmm. like made some improvements. I would just, you don't need to treat this as something that is an off season priority. You just need to, we need to communicate and discuss like when we're getting some throwing volume in, if we want to take some shots at trying to lean into what would happen and feeling, hey, can you try to move a little bit faster at the top? Uh, sure. And it kind of, it wasn't said in a way that was like, hey, this is definitely gonna work. But it, it was, you know, it was done in a way, it's evolved in a way where like, you can be, uh, you can communicate exactly what you're thinking, which is hard to do. 
and you could just be like, hey, like it is worth trying to move a little bit faster peak leg lift. Uh, but like if, if you feel horrible with it, we've got enough else going on here. And it is such a unique case of how slow you're moving relative to the athlete population that there's probably like a signature in there. And uh, we don't want to fight for that to the point of wasting the other things in the off season, throwing with intent, uh, maximizing it, throwing volume, et cetera. But we can find some 10, 15%, we can get some reps in there, we can try that. And it didn't work, but like that was the, that is an example, um, you know, but you, you know, it's also like, you well, are. That's a, that's a great point too. Cause it's like, it didn't work to fix it in like 15 throws. And so, and so then you're making a choice, which is like, okay, do we overhaul this entire delivery, you know, which is a multi-month process in order to chase this new thing? Or do we just go find some other place to spend our training economy, like developing a new pitch or like working on targeting strategies, which I think is, is an interesting, you know, thing to, to consider, which is like, all of this stuff happens within the constraints of the athlete's personal calendar and the level that they're at. Alex Cobb, at the time that you were having this conversation, was a big leaguer. Like, there's not, a, there's not another level to get to. If he was not presently a big leaguer, then yeah, we might have to like, we might be having the like, we need six months to overhaul the, the whole thing. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's a good, that's a good, uh, you know, th that is, the way that data is used effectively is to drive these conversations with athletes, right? Cause I think that's, I think that's ultimately what you're saying is like the best way to coach using this stuff is, you know, the best way to coach is with humility and knowledge and to like help these guys get as good as possible. But like this tool really helps with the knowledge component and with contextualizing it for the for the guys. Yeah. And I think one thing that we're seeing with markerless is like it speeds up that process, that iterative process of being a skilled coach, taking an educated guess, attempting something, incorporating feedback, adjusting approach. Right? Only gurus on Twitter get it right 100% of the time every time the first time right and Bro, so don't knock the twitter gurus <laughs> dude well, x the x gurus you know and so like we are confident in our approach but we are also humble enough to say that we're not going to get it right the first time every time okay if we're under those constraints and we're also under the constraints of within the athlete's own calendar like mike was saying um we need an iterative quick process to attempt something, get feedback, adjust an approach. And Markerless just speeds up that feedback loop exponentially compared to Markerd. Um, and because we have the Markerd reference, the historical data, we can kind of get the best of both worlds there. Right, yeah, the, uh, the context to Mike is a tough thing to like really uh, communicate from like a volume, like when you're listening to a podcast, but like for Cobb, it's like, Guy's gained some VLO. His career is trending in the right direction. So, like you said, it's not just that he's a big leaguer, but it's like he is trending in a direction where it's like it'd be pretty foolish yeah, yeah. to, to, you know what I mean. Whereas, like to your For point, sure. now if you're if you're 92 and you have to throw 95, yeah, you might have to just wholesale. You've got five years of training history under your belt. You, you got to take a shot at maybe that's the only way. Uh, you got you got to actually like risk knowing that it probably won't work, but it's acknowledging that that is like your best strategy to increase VO is maxing out yeah. that metric, or at least that's your foundational piece there. Um, but yeah, I think to Wasa's point, I think the the best way to coach when once you get this data is you either you know you either got to be you either have to accept it and like really leverage it in a way where like fuck I'm gonna have to learn a lot here I'm gonna have to update a lot I'm gonna be uh, you know, some degree, I mean, not as important as I like want it to be per se, but you do kind of learn to grow and see yourself um, in a way where like you don't ever feel like you have a coaching, um, like a, a core like thought of coaching outside of, hey, I'm gonna keep updating stuff. You don't, you don't become identified with one player you've built or fixed. You don't become identified with one mechanical cue. Um, you become identified with like 
just taking this for what it is and trying to add value to the athletes. And uh, whenever people ask me coaching advice or I, I always ask, but look, you want like, are you asking this in a way where you want like intrinsic or true talent value addition to the athlete? Like what, whatever question you have, are you asking this a way of like, I want to have a better job and make more money? Because those things don't always coexist. Uh, and if they did, drive on wouldn't exist, frankly, um, just being honest there. So the reason it's important, I think, is uh, there is just, if, if you really look at it through the athlete's eyes, if I look at it when I played, when I looked at it, when I go to the doctor's office, like, I just want to get better. And the instant I can get feedback from somebody who refers me to somebody else, or they just like are very honest with it, my trust in it explodes. And, and I feel like as a coach, um, that's the main thing to communicate to the athletes is like, hey, this is, I don't care about anything but you getting better. And I also don't care about the perception of who got you better. And I'm going to very truly proceed with this in a way where that's the reality of it. And I, and I think, that's very rare. Um, and I think there's a reason it's very rare. I think it's hard to distinguish yourself as a coach without, um, you know, being a, a bit assertive and a bit, um, you know, have, have a niche per se of what you do. But, um, you know, I think the some of the underconfidence stuff uh, and, and being honest with the data and applying it to the athlete, I, I do think you see better results um, across the board when, when that's kind of the strategy taken. So you think it yeah are there are there other places where like what what comes to mind when you think of like use, using this information over like a, a longer time period uh to to like have these different flavors of of conversations because on the on the one hand it's like there's an initial intake process but then there's like you know ideally months and months or years and years of of retests like where what what comes to mind when you think of like the real value of that? I mean, I think it's always a reference point. So whether you're good, bad, average at the time, like if you have that mocap data, you have the ability to to reference something regardless of like it, you know, it's it's just far more likely people are gonna come in and mocap it's human nature, like when they're, you know, trending downward. That's just, you know, I, I don't need data to showcase that as proof, to be honest. That's how like confident I am just looking through stuff. Um, but it, it can help, right? If you're 96 and you're 27 and then you're 30 and lose your velocity, if you have the 96 mocap, um, and it's like an insurance policy, right? And the conversations and such too, um, yeah, you know, there's, there, there, I think one thing, honestly, is people, uh, when people are really good, they, uh, they tend to not get a whole lot of information from the code. Like they don't want to, the coaches, like rightfully so, maybe don't want to be accountable. I don't blame them to be honest, but, but what they're trying to do is just like uh, appease the pitcher and like, hey, it's working. What I found though is there's sometimes very talented athletes who uh, will actually have some inefficiencies and the instant it might lead to an injury or it might lead to a problem. And it could be as simple as like, well, the coach doesn't like, you know, the athlete's been good and never is thrown on track, man. Sure. And that's fine, but hey, now he's he's struggling a little bit, and because he hasn't assessed or gotten this type of information in between outings, the coaches are still like, hey, I don't want to jack this guy up, but he that, that athlete is going to be doing all kinds of stuff. And uh, a, a basic example that comes to mind is like I know uh, Shane Bieber with his curveball, uh, like he would be throwing it all the time between outings during the the seasons, and uh, like an extreme amount. And it's like he gets on the track, man, kind of changes the grip. And he's just, I can just tell he had no clue that the pitch shape was that consistent in terms of like, like when you're playing catch and you don't have a track, man, it doesn't matter how good you are at baseball. Your first, when you're throwing flat grounds, you're throwing, like when you throw a good curveball, it feels like it moves, you know, three feet. And then when you throw one high, you think it like doesn't move. But it's like the track, man, in that, you know, assessment value, is actually understanding that like you don't have to throw a bunch of curveballs and it was just like a location yep. thing and i don't think i think there's little things like that that can be uh hard to communicate because they're more they're more of like uh people don't like to be drawn to like uh hedges as much uh or is that the word for it when you hedge a bet right it's not it's not as sure. fun to uh talk about like 
an insurance policy or, you know, being a little bit diversified with your portfolio. The probabilistic of, nature of improvement. Right. Yeah. But you, you still get some value in just like getting the information from a different source. And like, sometimes you don't know where it's going to come from. And that's like, I think that's why I always pitch the, the value of assessment and such is just like, you, even if you're really good, you, you could have some small things where you may be lucked out and you're doing some things that are efficient, but it could eventually um, kind of creep into some wasted time, you know? And uh, so uh, mechanics, I even used track me in there in that example, but I think those those things still apply. And I think in the briefly, uh, in the example that the people who are outliers with their mechanics are doing weird stuff. It's like very critical, I think, that they uh, know their mechanics and are able to explain to their coach, like why it, why it is okay i think we talked a little bit about hey it's funky and it works who cares i think that's the easy thing i think what they really need to focus on though is like what happens when it starts not working a little bit can you at least explain why it's okay that your mechanics like you need, you did need to give a component that doesn't have to do with how many outs you get or how many strikeouts you get you need to actually like hey my lead leg still gets in the right spot though that is extremely important um for a lot of those guys because they'll sometimes just slump and their talent isn't going down, but it's so easy to want to change all of that. And if they can explain yeah. it in a way that isn't reliant on their performance, uh, it, it, it definitely defends their ability to, you know, not get tinkered with there. Um, unless if, you know, there's a genuine reason to do it, but often it, it, people are in the direction of wanting to be causal with things. So that's why I think it's important. You're going to get causal coaching. That's what, like, this is a whole aspect of like, always want to, trying to intervene and, and take action if you can to feel like you have a bigger hold on the situation than you do. If you have that data to like counteract those inevitabilities, you just like can kind of uh, shock the pitching coach to some degree by by kind of explaining it in that way. Um, how do you how do you think about uh, like use, using this information to to sculpt out like drill packages for for guys or like because there is there is this like uh there is this like probabilistic thing which is like hey look like uh there there are some core ways that we know to teach like the six phases of the of the delivery right like to to line those things up so that we're like creating good energy flow through the ball and we're getting the most out of our bodies that we possibly can uh there's that which is just like hey we know that these work generally in sequence and we have some constraint and let approaches there versus like, but we also know that like this works for him or we're like trying to get this feel out of a player. Like how do you, how do you think about putting together uh, drill packages based off of the mocap data? So, I mean, I think you've always got your kind of initial thing that comes up and I think what you need to do once you have like basically to, to so I summarize better for the audience, but like if you, we get these uh, automated drill packages, which are effectively like used with uh, inferences and, and some previous data stuff to kind of give an initial, hey, here's where the hierarchy is, the rank of it. And the idea is the higher the score, um, the more likely it is that like, hey, you probably shouldn't defer from that drill. You know, that's kind of the, the basis of it. Um, I think I think a lot of it is honestly that some of this is a bit more of the nuanced coaching, I think, where you're talking when you have the drill packages, but then you're talking through with the mechanics in a way where you're trying to see uh, if a certain drill package, um, it, sometimes guys will get taught to do the opposite of what the drill package teaches. That is a good one to like get to the drill package. And then honestly, it's pretty quick to just, hey, just like throw the ball normal. Um, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean by it? What do you mean by somebody gets yes, taught and, the know, opposite it, of it, the drill? What, what do you mean by that? Like maybe they uh, they might have the coach might have like a you know you have to do your arm action like this you don't want it too close uh, or you want it closer to your ear and then it's like way too close or like hey you need to use your legs like this um, and they kind of train. Oh, like that's like another voice of information that they would like, get. Like if I have that context and I have the drill package context. I want to have the context of what they've been doing and what they've maybe been trying to do because that will then allow me with the drill packages to know uh, some of them are a bit more like 
uh, exaggerated, I would say, and some of them are a bit more loose, for lack of a better term, meaning like it's a bit closer to a regular throw. If I have context that a guy has been training or is like thinking of something when they throw, that like, if they just natch, if I can get them to authentically throw the ball, because they've been like angled to do something differently, their odds of like getting to that right degree of mechanical mm. improvement are much higher. If you take uh, you know a, a certain approach with it, or make you get drastic very early, just so they can feel it when they have it, and then you kind of give them more of those loose. Okay, now let's do this with some authenticity and intent, um, and kind of get that kink out of your mechanics. So it really is a it really is a conversation game. I think it's uh, if you can get more context on the athlete's previous training history, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get as much information to uh, you know. There's honestly times where a guy can have really bad mechanics, uh, be really bad in the weight room, and have really bad throwing volume. And it's just like, hey, we're not. Who gives a sh you know? Who cares about mechanics right now? Like it's just not. That's that. That's far and away. I don't care if it's bad. We got other things that like. If you improve those other things, I guarantee you're going to see a correlation of mechanics go up, whether you're focused on it or not. So sure. Um, that I don't know if that like answers you, answer you specifically on the drill package, but you get basically your initial hypotheses, uh, and I think those uh, you know initial drill suggestions are kind of done with the idea of just like. Uh, if you hypothetically could imagine neutral context, just somebody who walked into driveline and kind of understands mechanics, that's kind of how those drills are um, relayed. And then yeah. once you acquire more context, um, that's when you can kind of, that's where you get your alterations. Um, or you just like, if nothing else, you just get a little bit different buy-in from the athlete on how they approach that drill um, and how they approach their, their sessions. And you might inspire a bit more feedback on, hey, you were telling me this and here's what I felt. and. Uh, hey, this clicked. So a lot of it, honestly, is con I, just so much of it is getting context from your like initial baseline data, and that's kind of the that's kind of the magic at all of it, I think. Yeah. Well, so I'm curious from from your perspective, like what you, you've obviously you know uh, were a PhD candidate at one of the prominent labs in the in the in the country. You are a doctor now, uh, although you didn't want me to tell anyone that. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, you've seen the way that the market has evolved uh, from a biomechanics perspective, uh, both in, in an academic setting and, and also kind of here. Like, what, what, what mistakes do you see people making currently with, like, with biomechanics data? Because it has gotten popular. Like it's easier than ever to use. Hawkeye is, uh, you know, has all this joint tracking and, and limb tracking now. Uh, and so it will just increasingly, you know, be popularized. But what are, what are like the current set of mistakes that people make when they try to engage with this type of stuff now? Um, I think probably the easiest one to make is information overload. Um, you, we are able to get so much information, so much high density data from these motion capture systems, from these force plates, um, from these ball tracking technologies that it can sometimes become paralysis by analysis. Um, that's probably the most common one that I see. That's why I really like our approach here of, you know, we've got dimension reduction, we boil it down. Uh, to as few things as we think is reasonably plausible. And then from there, we provide the avenues to then expand within each one of those sub areas. Uh, I think that approach um, should be adapted, you know, whenever possible. Start simple, start small, expand in depth, expand in detail from there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's probably the biggest one that I think is, it's very easy to, it's very easy to run into because you get so much data from, from these systems. Sure. Where, where do you guys, uh, we, we can, we can end on this one, but where, where do you guys see sort of like the future of these systems going? Like both, I guess, like industry wide, but also like specific here at driveline, like what, what are you most excited about Chris for, you know, for the coming years? I think some, some of it is the, you know, getting more and more individual, analysis to see like how critical that is or if it is just like we like on average when you take the sample versus an individual like 
how much are we changing from the, you know, in each individual case? What's like the variance and like what our expected correlations were and what they actually were. That would just give a lot of value towards like, hey, uh, you need to, you know, pitching really is a bit more like golf where like you, you need to make sure you're constantly um, getting a bunch of things done for yourself and, and getting cost of communication with somebody you can interpret and trust. Um, mm -hmm. And that would, that would kind of validate that because you, you do get a very quantitative benefit from getting the retests um, and being able to communicate that in a way where like, as a coach, you understand like the differences and now you have like this one athlete, whereas if he goes and trains somewhere else, well, now that coach and him are going to have completely term different terminology. It doesn't mean that coach isn't uh, good or whatever, but it's, it's, it's sometimes it's a lot more difficult after you've worked with a guy for a while to now transition from that trust terminology and, and kind of saying the same thing. And then the command stuff I think is interesting. I think it's, I think it's really interesting from a, um, individual point of view as well. Uh, I think the sample population could be uh, pretty telling, just like directions of misses as, as long as you like control for, for pitch type. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, I think that component of it is pretty interesting to me because I think, uh, I think command is probably a bit, you know, more, uh, there's a lot more confidence when somebody salads a ball to like, yo, your, you know, your, your trunk flew open or like, uh, whatever look at where your gloves facing like they're just way more sure. they're just like, you, you know it's just like yeah hey, if it's whatever nobody likes seeing balls thrown to the backstop and things like that but like if, if, if like as a coach you can't actually provide like an analysis that like for the upcoming pitches is going to influence the results in a better way then like great if you want to you know be that guy who just acknowledges that a bad thing happened then go ahead and like you know, tell them there's some solid pitching mechanics going on but i think the the mo gap what's interesting is kind of being able to see that um, and maybe get, get, get feel for how influential command training is through mechanics, if it is at all. Um, but I think you would find some interesting things, especially with, uh, I think the big thing with command and, and mechanics and, and the combination of, or whatever, is just like finding pairs of, uh, pairs of data. So like if the direction of the miss correlates with, um, a certain body sure. part, now you actually have for that guy his command might be a bit more fixable than somebody who's um doesn't really have any clear location it's just like their commands kind of sprayed all over in their uh, mechanics are just like whatever they're bad for command mechanics but if you can have it the the cool thing about command is there is a location element of it and a direction element of it where it, it, you get this like um dart type of strategy where you can pick where you want to throw it on the board to like yeah everybody knows the bullseye is worth the most or wait the triple 20 is whatever so not everybody i guess but uh <laughs> if you're if you're playing that game with your friends and like nobody's played before it's just like the best way to do that is definitely just like you know try trying to figure out like the the shotgun spray of like where to throw it in your average value per throw so yeah. If you have that with command and it is in a certain direction i can see mechanics influencing that to a higher degree and i think then it just adds uh you're gonna find guys whose command are bad and when you look at a sample it just says bad 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 but what you're going to be able to do with the mechanics i think is eventually be able to pull these guys who have room to grow with mechanics and i think my biggest thing i think physically it's very easy to see people having room to go with velocity you can kind of tell what somebody's gonna throw a little harder uh you can kind of see even with their eyes some mechanical flaws up suggested but with mechanics I, I don't or sorry with the command i don't think it's super evident to like look at somebody uh, and be like this guy's going to command the ball well someday like i just don't you know it's it maybe it is maybe i'm just behind on that but like someday <laughs> well i think i think that's the thing right is like uh you know there there are definitely people who walk the earth who are baseball coaches or baseball players who have seen so much of the game that they can actually you know be like hey this guy has good mechanics or this guy has a fast arm or this guy has you know is going to be able to command the ball well because they've just seen enough and they have that pattern but it's very it's very difficult uh for that person to explain the thought process to a naive person uh or to just you know somebody that doesn't have that gift uh and that is true i mean that's historically the value of data across all sports right it's like it's not like trackman invented the high spin fastball being valuable guys have been throwing invisibles since you know whatever walter johnson but like the point is that like 
one guy could see that and he could see that player's unique value, but then he couldn't get anybody else to figure it out. Uh, whereas like if you have a data set, you can, you can more easily connect the dots on performance, these other things. And then all of a sudden it's like infinitely translatable, not just like from Chris to me to Kyle, but like Chris to me to Kyle to into Spanish, into Japanese, like it, it starts to become like infinitely extensible to just get universal understanding of like, yeah, this person has like this specific command cluster and biomechanical signature like that. It, that is actually very exciting. Right. I think one thing quick too, to be specific on kind of like the difference is the, I think the scout and the, like, you can see these, Hey, he's got like, you know, he's pretty like, not a whole lot of moving parts or whatever. And what you can do as a scout and as an analyst, let's say we like are, are pretty in agreement. Good guys can see this. You can say, Hey, this guy uh, has a higher probability from what we've seen that his command will improve or he will be able to throw strikes at the next right. level. What you can't do is you that, that is like a draft and like, you're just saying you've seen this type of player three years down the road, that guy tends to see his command improve. What I'd like to do with the mocap lab in the command stuff is not evaluate whose command is like, you know, capable of potentially improving through due to their mechanics. I'd like to actually see like, who are the guys that like have these things that are very unattractive to a scout and can they play their miss? Can they like do some things even if they don't change their mechanics, they just change right. where they aim the ball in a direction that is not as simple as down the middle. And just like they're trying to throw the ball on the ground and it's just like strikes all day, you know, like, so, so there's little yep. things like that where I think the development aspect of command is very hard. I think the uh, understanding if somebody has the potential to improve command, I think the scout and, and like what you're saying is like accurate. I think it's, it's, probably just like a hey on average when we draft this type of player they tend to see their command improve why will their mechanics and stuff set them up for that and then there's like another why that like it is very difficult to understand and interpret yep. and that's like i think our job is to get that one and then also for the guys who don't have mechanics that would infer uh from what we know now like good command or whatever what can we do is it a mechanical fix is it a location aim fix how can we kind of solve that problem that does not have uh, really even an identifiable quantitative acceptance at this point where like we don't even know how to know for sure when somebody has that aspect. And then how can we actually uh, like go about the development to, to get those results? It's a very fun and unique problem that's, uh, you know, data driven, but also demands a lot of baseball uh, feel and, and, and intellect. And um, it's kind of why you, you still, you know, it is still very critical to have a, 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 water, a minimum tolerance of analytical ability, but also minimum tolerance of baseball ability uh, and feel and understanding to really like, you know, get, get these types of things to a current scale um, or to, to be innovative, like, you know, driveline has been. Yep. All right. Very good. Command driven biomechanical insights coming soon to a driveline launch pad near you. Uh, thanks for, thanks for coming on guys. And, uh, for everybody at home, thanks for listening. We'll see you guys soon.